Welcome back. Today we're going to start talking about a really important topic, uh, that of stochastic gradient descent. So what is this uh, about and, and uh, where does the motivation for this come from? So, so far, everything that we've been doing has uh, depended on using exact evaluations of gradients or subgradients. Everything so far, we've used either the gradient of our function at a point x or some element of the subdifferential. It's really the same, the same thing. The setting that we want to switch to considering now is when, for a variety of reasons, which we're going to discuss in detail, we don't want to use the exact gradient, but rather a noisy version of it. So why would that be? Um, so in this next series of lectures, we will consider this next sequence. We'll consider the setting where, first, perhaps we don't have exact access or full access to a subdifferential. So we may not have full or exact access to some element of the subdifferential. And the question is, can we, can we make do with this? Uh, for example, we may have only have noisy access. So we may only have access to a noisy version of this. Or, and the second one is primarily the, uh, the, the setting which we're going to consider, we may in principle have access to an element of the subdifferential or the full gradient in the case where the function is smooth. But it may just be so expensive to compute that we want to understand how much can we do if we uh, how much can we do with less. So we may have access to gx or the gradient of f of x, but this may be expensive to compute. So we instead use an approximate or something that we could again call a noisy version of it. Or noisy, though actually the best word to use is the word that's in the title, a stochastic version. So let's turn to a few specific examples to see uh, what, what, this, what this setting is exactly. <clears throat> so our picture so far has been as follows. We want to minimize f of x subject to x in a constraint set. And just like we said in the previous slide, what we've been using is access to this oracle. We can think about it in this way. We've used that word before where we put in x, this is our call to the oracle, and we get out the gradient of f of x, or if it's not smooth and therefore not differentiable, uh, perhaps we just get uh, an element of the subdifferential of f at x. So instead, what we're going to look at now is the setting where x goes in, and instead of receiving the gradient or a subgradient, we're going to receive a random variable. And what we know about, about g tilde is that in expectation, it's equal to what we want, though it might be, it might be different from that in any, in any particular instance. So in other words, all we know is that this holds. So we're going to consider this in three specific cases. One is the setting of a generic noisy gradient. I'll explain what that is. Then I'm going to talk about stochastic optimization. Stochastic optimization in the setting of empirical risk minimization is uh, so important that the term stochastic gradient descent, abbreviated by SGD, is um, 
even though it, it means something much more general as, as, as we're discussing in this lecture, SGD is frequently associated just with this second point of uh, stochastic optimization in the context of empirical risk minimization. So most of our time in the next, in the next several lectures is gonna be focused on this setting. Um, and uh, the third potential setting is uh, random coordinate descent. So let's take these in order. Noisy gradients. So what, would, uh, what does this mean? The setting of noisy gradients is instead of getting our exact gradient, perhaps we get x goes into our stochastic oracle and we get back g tilde of x, which we can think about as the gradient of f of x or subdifferential of f of x, plus some noise. W is zero mean noise. Since it's zero mean, this means that the expected value of g tilde x is equal to the expected value of the gradient of f of x plus w gradient of f of x has no random descendant, so this is equal to just the gradient of f of x plus expected value of w, and this is equal to zero by the zero mean assumption. So why would we choose to look at a model like this? Well, first of all, there might be some reason for which all you can get is noisy gradients but uh, in, in, in this formulation, but as you can see, this is a fairly generic setup, and this will allow us to model many different situations where you have for whatever reason, you have only access to approximate oracles. But let's get a little more specific and look at two cases that are very important. So stochastic optimization. <clears throat> In its most general form, stochastic optimization says, I don't want to minimize a deterministic function that I know. And this, is, this has been our life so far in this course, minimizing this. Instead, suppose that We'd like to minimize over x, let me make that clear, the expected value of a stochastic function. So I'm gonna write this explicitly as f of x semicolon xi, where xi is my random variable and f depends on that in some way. So let me denote it in this way. Again, subject to x in x. So what is this kind of strange, what is this setting that might appear strange to us? This shouldn't appear strange because this is ex actually exactly the main problem of interest in many machine learning applications. Why is that? In many, or I should say al almost all, um, machine learning applications, in particular, in supervised learning, What do we want to minimize? So let's take, for example, a regression problem. What's the setting in regression? The setting in regression is that there is some relationship between x and y and we want to learn it. So we want to learn how to predict a label y in the regression setting this would be a continuous label given x a vector of features. This isn't specifically a class where we're gonna consider the techniques about this. But implicitly, every, te every technique, every algorithm, every idea that we've discussed in this class has a direct application to this. So this is the underlying unspoken, unspoken theme of this, of, this entire, of this entire class. So I'm not gonna go into too many examples, but um, you can think of, of, of any particular setting you like where you're trying to predict a continuous label based on features. So 
I want to know, I have a particular algorithm, a particular method for given x, how I predict this label. That's my function f of x. And how well do I do? Well, I could see how well I do on data that I've already seen, but really what I care about is to know how I do in the future, how I do on data points that I have not seen. So one way to think about this is how, what is the expected performance of my regression function um, in, in the future? So if f is our prediction function, then, sorry, f is, f is our, uh, our loss function, sorry. If f is our loss function, then the expectation of f is our expected loss. So to tie it specifically to the setting that we've described above, what would this be? To, to link it directly to this. So let's write our regression as follows. We see, so actually I've confused the notation here a little bit because x is our decision. So let me, let me correct that. Let me correct that here. So I shouldn't, so you see this x, I shouldn't have called that x. Let me call that a different variable and to link it as closely as possible to the notation I wrote above, we'll call that C. So, um, so we see C and then we predict, just a simple linear regression here, C transpose X. This is our linear function of what we're, of what we're predicting and the truth is y, that's the true label, and so we incur loss if we're looking at ordinary least square setting, y, which is the truth, minus x transpose c squared. So looking up what we have above, the regression setting in the context of stochastic optimization is saying, please find an x that minimizes your expected squared loss. Minimize y minus c transpose x squared. So this is the basic problem that we face in regression. And we could take a classification problem and write it in exactly the same way. So we see that this is actually quite a bit different from what we've, uh, what we've seen so far. And it's not clear just with what we've written so far how we would handle this. So let's dig in a little bit closer and see how do we actually solve these kinds of problems. Again, remembering that I want to tie this back to optimization because this is what we want to, what we want to focus on here. So I want to solve this problem. Let's stick with regression for just another moment and then we'll go back to the, to the general setting. I want to minimize over x, just writing exactly what was on the previous page, over c, my squared loss, y minus c transpose x squared. Now if we don't know anything about the distribution here, then it's it's difficult for us it's difficult for us to do uh, to do much. But the typical setting here is that we've actually seen we don't know the distribution. If we did, then we would have to do we'd have to we'd have to use that in some way. But we may have seen only samples of the distribution. So a very common setting is that we have seen what's called training data and 
we want to learn from these. We want to use these to learn a good linear rule x. Okay, so what, what would this look like? This means that we might have seen many pairs, y1, xe1, y2, xe2, yn, xn. And instead of minimizing this above expectation, which we cannot do if we don't know the distribution, instead we say, let's just treat these data as the entire universe and minimize the empirical loss. So the empirical loss, the empirical loss is just the average loss over these data. Yi minus Xi transpose X squared. And minimizing this is sometimes called ERM, empirical risk minimization. And so minimizing the empirical loss is called ERM, empirical risk minimization. And I'll refer to this sometimes as, as ERM. OK, let's take another step back and, and, and write this in a different way. So what we're seeing here is that what I actually want to minimize, so let's write this more generally, the optimization problem moving away from the specific motivation of regression or, or, or empirical risk minimization. So more generally, what this motivates is that I'd like to minimize f of x. Perhaps I have a constraint set as well, so I'll just, I'll just write that. Where f of x has a very special form, where f of x is equal to the sum of component functions fi of x. So again, just to make this connection, so in the regression setting, fi of x is just equal to yi minus xi transpose x squared. But I want to now focus on this setting. So let's see why stochastic gradient descent is a good way to think about how we might address this problem. So what did we have? Now moving purely back into the optimization setting, I want to minimize 1 over n times the sum of fi of x subject to x in x. We have this function. We can clearly compute its gradient. What does gradient descent look like for this function? Gradient descent tells me that xt plus 1 should equal to xt minus my step size times a gradient of this thing. Now, what is that? Well, the gradient of a sum is just the sum of the gradients. So this is equal to xt minus eta times 1 over n times the sum of the gradient of a notational error here. So this is fi of x. Um, the gradient of fi of x. Again, what's fi of x? It, in the regression setting, it's just the loss of the ith data point. So if n is large, and again, just to bring up ERM, in empirical risk minimization, n is equal to the number of data points you have, then computing a gradient, something that we've taken for granted, could actually be very expensive because it requires a full pass over the data. So let's write that down. Computing the gradient of f, which is equal to the sum of the gradient of each component function fi, could be very expensive. In particular, it requires a full pass over the data. 
Now, even for something as simple as regression, where the computation of the gradient for each individual fi is very simple, doing a full pass over the data, you all of a sudden might not be limited by computation. You might be limited by I.O. So this is, this is a really important point. It's even more important in the setting of neural networks where each gradient computation itself could be very, could be very expensive. So what do we want to do instead? How are we going to tie this to, a to, the, to the concept of a noisy gradient? So let's see. Again, we have f is equal to 1 over n times the sum of the fi. And the full gradient of f is equal to the sum of the gradients of each fi. So instead of using this, what will our noisy box give us? x goes in. Instead of the full gradient, we're going to get, to keep our notation from before, g tilde, which is equal to the gradient of a randomly selected fi evaluated at x. So I've used capital I here to denote a uniform random variable. So I is a uniform random variable on 1 to n. So what does this mean? It means when I, I put an x, to my oracle that's supposed to give me back a gradient. Instead of computing the gradient at every single point and adding them up and returning the full gradient, what my oracle is going to do is it's going to randomly select a point. That's indicated here by, the, by, the, by this random variable i. And it's only going to compute the gradient of the loss at that particular point. So let's check if this, in fact, fits into the framework that we're, that we're looking at. So let's check. is the gradient of fi of x indeed a stochastic gradient. In other words, we need to check if the expected value, and this is over the only randomness that's, that's inside here, that's the random variable i, that's what the expectation is over, of the gradient of fi of x, what is this equal to? We need to check that it, in, that it is indeed equal to the full gradient of, fi, of f. So what is the expectation? Well, this is just the sum of the possible outcomes times the probability that our randomness takes that outcome. So this is the sum over all possible outcomes that our random variable i could take. It could take any value from 1 to n. And if it does, then our random variable inside is delta is the gradient of fi times the probability that this happens. Capitalize a uniform random variable, so this happens with probability 1 over n. And you see, bring the 1 over n outside, that indeed I have exactly the property that I need. So this equals gradient of f of x. We spent a lot of time talking about this example. And that's because we're going to focus quite a bit on this, on, on this example. The, cap the calculations are quite simple to show that it's a stochastic gradient. But uh, it, is, it, it is a case that's really important in machine learning, extremely important in large-scale machine learning when the number of samples scales uh, because the gradient computation, again, becomes a major bottleneck in our algorithm. So we're going to come back to this and, and deal with this extensively. But for the time being, let's move on to our third case of coordinate descent. Our setting is minimize f of x subject to x and x. And in this case, I'm not going to assume that f de uh, decomposes as a sum of, of variables of, of functions. I'm just going to observe that in many settings, it's much easier to compute a partial derivative than it is to compute the full gradient. Indeed, the gradient of f of x requires us to compute d partial derivatives if x is in rd. So the gradient, just by definition, is the partial derivative of f with respect to x1 all the way down to the partial derivative of f with respect to xd. Here I'm assuming that x is in rd. So what is a stochastic gradient that exploits this fact of uh, the that the gradient is simply just all of the partial derivatives? Well, 
writing it exactly in the same picture as before, instead of taking the full gradient, what I'm going to return is my random variable is going to just select one of these coordinates and return that. So in other words, it's going to randomly select some index. I'll use j here to, to denote the index of which, which variable I take. And it's going to be 0 everywhere else. So here I've got the derivative of f with respect to x, capital J, to indicate that that's a random variable, and zeros everywhere else. And for, and I will scale this up by d. We'll see in a second why we need that. OK, so same thing. Let's just check what is the expectation over the randomness. In this case, our randomness is j, which is uniformly distributed on 1 to d. It randomly selects one of the coefficients and, and returns that partial. So the expectation of g tilde x is, again, the same thing as we said before. It's the sum from j equals 1 to d. That's the possible outcomes it could take, times the probability that it will take that outcome. So the possible outcomes it could take are, for each j, d times the partial derivative with respect to the jth coefficient. I'm using little j because that's the realization, not the random variable, times the probability that it takes that value, 1 over d. And now you can see why I scaled up by d. These cancel. And if I sum all of these, I get exactly the gradient. So this is yet another example of a stochastic gradient. So each of these has a different um, has a different uh, uh, has a different noise um, um, has a different interaction with noise. We talked about the setting where the most general generic setting where we think about getting a gradient plus noise. We thought about the setting where we're selecting one of, uh, one of the functions at random. And we thought about the setting where we're getting one of the coordinates at random. Oops. So let's see, let's draw a picture and see what this, what this does. And I want to, in particular, focus on the setting of f of x equaling 1 over n times the sum of fi of x. Again, this is our empirical risk minimization setting. And we might as well stick with regression. So what's going to happen here? What would our algorithm, what's our, what's our algorithm going to look like? So let me draw a setting, a regression setting, where we can see what the solution will be. It will be basically a 45 degree line. But you can see here that it's not going to be an extremely good fit. And let's draw another picture where, again, the solution will be about the same, but the fit is going to be much, much more, much more accurate. So this is our high variance setting. And then over here, I've got my low variance setting. <clears throat> What's our algorithm going to be? Well, our stochastic gradient descent algorithm is going to be exactly like gradient descent I'm just going to replace my gradient with my stochastic gradient. xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus eta, not times the gradient or a subdifferential, but g tilde x. So what is this going to look like in each of these cases? So let's just kind of simulate what this would be like in regression. In regression, to make our life very simple and to make this illustration easy, suppose that we're just fitting lines through the origin. Visually, it looks like that's probably going to be the right solution anyway. So we initialize at some point x0. x, x here is, is basically going to be the slope. So let me initialize at a non-optimal point. So what's going to happen? What would gradient descent do? Gradient descent would look over all of these points, compute the loss to all of these points, add it, take the derivative, and realize that I need to shift this curve, make it more steep. What is stochastic gradient descent going to do? SGD is going to pick one of these points at random. Which one of these points will it pick? We don't know. But 
Let's suppose that it picks, say, this point that I just circled. Well, it's going to compute the loss. And essentially, what the stochastic gradient descent step is going to do is it's going to try to improve the life of that single point. And therefore, it will rotate this line in what appears to us to be the right, the right direction. On the other hand, SGD could also pick this point. If it picks that point, then computing the gradient, the gradient step for, with respect to that point will ask me to shift this line in what appears to be the wrong direction. So what we see here is that gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, is not always going to improve. There's always going to be a chance that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make my life worse at any particular step. And this slide is about the role of variance. And what you can see by comparing these two pictures, let me draw the, sim the, the similar red line here on the right. So here you see that actually for this line, because there's less variance, there's a much higher likelihood that any of the points that I select are going to ask me to move the line in the correct direction. So at least pictorially, we're seeing here that there should be a, 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 there should be a role to play here for variance. If there's high variance, we should expect our life to be more difficult. If there's less variance, things will be, things will be better. So let's think about how this connects to the past and what else, we've, uh, what else we've seen. So one of the most important things that we considered when we were considering gradient descent and subgradient descent, it's tempting to call subgradient descent SGD, but SGD will refer to stochastic gradient descent. We considered the difference between these two functions. If you go back to the lectures, you'll see that what we saw that's, that's fundamentally different about these two and why gradient descent or subgradient descent exhibit different rates of convergence is that this example on the left, let me just label these A and B, A exhibits what we call the self-tuning property. What does that mean? It means that as x goes to the optimal solution, the gradient of f of x goes to 0. But b has no self-tuning. And you can just see this pictorially. No matter how close you are to the optimal solution, which is 0, the gradient will always have magnitude 1. And so what did we have to do here? We were forced to take a very small step size. And this mean, meant that we had a bit slower convergence. So what's going to happen with SGD? Let's look back at this picture and think, if we're at the optimal solution, as this line here, as this line slowly converges to the optimal line, which I'll draw in dots, what's going to happen? Does a stochastic gradient, does its, does, its, uh, does its magnitude also go to zero or not? I'll leave that as a cliffhanger. We're going to stop here, pick this up next time.